Okay, that's enough. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Hey, guys, it's Ted Bogert with the Ted Show. Yes, it's the Ted Show at 6 o'clock. I know you guys were asking me, why are you so late? But this is such an important topic. This is such uh, something that we all need to talk about. We need to learn about. And these amazing human beings have been gracious enough to come on and talk about racial justice in the black trans community. So I want to welcome, we'll just start up in the Brady Bunch uh, way. We've got Nicole Parker, Hi. Mulan Williams, and Angelica Jones here. Um, of course, I have to give credit and uh, for helping me out, Gina Lee Duncan with Quality Florida. She's amazing. Uh, and their website is down at the bottom. Uh, her work, she is tireless, tirelessly works, just like all of you do, uh, to bring equality um, to Florida for all all genders, all races, all identifications, all people. So, um, all right. So the reason why I reached out to her, which you may or may not know, is I kept reading articles about black, the increase in black trans women, black trans women murders, uh, just to kick it off. That's, that's where my headset was. So I wanna talk about that. I wanna get into some of the questions that I have, but I think it's super important for the audience to hear at least a little bit of origin story. So we're gonna start with you, Nicole. Tell us a little bit about you and then tell us um, what it was like for you. This is one of Gina's questions and I like it. What it was like for you uh, to transition uh, into the community. Sure. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Parker, uh, pronoun she, her, hers. I am with um, the project coordinator with Equality Florida and also with the One Pulse Foundation. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my transition, I guess that it was a journey, to say the least. I'm in year nine. So sometimes when I look back, I'm like, geez, it's been that long. But when, when you look long term, it was kind of the craziest thing of my life, if you will. Um, so at the age of about 15, I knew younger, but at the age of 15, I knew to myself, I was like, okay, I think that I'm definitely trans. So fast forward to 19, I ended up um, leaving my job, selling my car and everything and going to transition. Well, little did I know, I was young, naive. I wasn't realizing everything that was gonna come with transitioning, um, quickly ran out of money. And um, inevitably I kind of fell into the sex work industry. And in, in that, I wasn't really realizing and ready for all of the trauma and things that were going to come with that. You know what I mean? So many trans individuals fall into that for so many different reasons, whether it's difficulty finding work, whether that's being rejected from jobs. I don't think people really understand that sometimes trans people go in for interviews and when they are, when somebody finds out that they're trans, all of a sudden that job is off the table for them. So, I mean, it just kind of depends on the experience of each individual, but sometimes it is really hard. So went through that life. And then in 2015, I came back to Orlando and I was like, listen, I'm going to try to get a job and try to change my life and do things like that. Um, I was able to work for a mental health agency and then Pulse happened. So living in Orlando, you know, we really have three LGBTQ clubs. So all of them you have your own memories with. And um, I had special memories at Pulse. And when that happened, it really kind of sparked my advocacy. And that's when my advocacy began. And one of the things that uh, Pulse uncovered amongst many was that there was really no seat at the table for trans individuals when it came to making decisions. It simply was being honest, gay white men that were sitting in a room and they were saying what trans people needed. And I'm sitting here kind of like, hello, you know, trans people all around. Why don't you get somebody who can sit on this panel or sit on this board or something and who could really advocate for their community? So- Nicole, why do you think, may I ask, why do you think it was like that? Because that was one of the things we talked about before we went live, that I was just so, I was surprised that that was something that you all had to push for. And that even in the beginnings of my involvement, when it was called uh, MBA and now it's called Pride Chamber, uh, that the trans, the, the bringing the trans community to the table, it just wasn't there where I thought it should be. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know if people really realize, I think outwardly looking in, we everybody seems to think that we're this one LGBTQ community and we're all inclusive and everything like that. And I don't really think it's like that. I think trans people are shunned a lot in the community. Um, there's gay men, there's lesbians. It doesn't matter who, what, where, when, and why, but there's some individuals who feel like we're the clowns of the community or we've gone too far. I've heard and seen it all. And for me, I'm like, we're supposed to be one inclusive community. There's already the rest of the world against us. Why can't we just be together? But I think, you know, there, 
that had a lot to do with it. I'm curious to see um, the other yes. two girls' opinions on that, just because I think there's a lot of factors that went into that. Thank you for sharing that. I, I have lots of questions, but I want to give, so we're going to go Mulan. Tell us about your, a uh, little bit about you, your background, and um, what your transition was like. Hello, I am Mulan Montrese Williams. I am here from Orlando, born and raised. I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. You might want to speak a little louder. Is that better? Yell at me if you need to. <laughs> um, yes, I'm Mulan Montrese Williams. I was born and raised here in Orlando, Florida. I am the outreach coordinator for Miracle of Love, as well as was the founder for Divas in Dialogue, which is a trans woman support group here in Orlando. Um, and they, the groups are held at the Stafford House. Um, a little bit about my transition. Um, I transitioned over 20 something years ago. Um, here in Florida, I must say it was, I went a route that I wish I didn't go, which was black market silicone. And for me, it was, easy to get um so that's how i came into my, my womanhood here in orlando it was very easy for me to get that here um it, and it was a journey i tried i remember just now being on here i remember when i first met angelica um i was working at a call center as as trans and it went well for a while until the bathroom situation got a little hectic with some of the employees um and that led me to look for other work at other places and i, I couldn't get one and i kind of dove into sex work um from there i've been to prison jail i've had i can really write a book about it um it has been hard but um three years ago i started working in the field with miracle of love and ever since then i've been having an amazing ride and I've been reaching back, looking back, trying to bring all my trans sisters with me. Fantastic. Thank you. And Gina, Gina is pop, Gina did pop on, by the way. All right, Angelica, last but not least, tell us a little bit about you and about your trans journey. Okay, well, my name's Angelica Jones, as it says. Um, I'm also known as Angelica Sanchez. Uh, I started my transition probably around the age of 16, 17. Um, and I started taking hormones about uh, 18, 19. And um, I'm originally from Jacksonville, Florida. And my life uh, took a different route than, uh, well, I wouldn't say most trans girls. When I came out, it was what, 1996 is when I graduated and I decided to move from Jacksonville, Florida to Orlando. And uh, the main thing and reason for that was that I had more opportunities uh, as far as gay clubs. And um, I've always been a performer. So the art of drag and female impersonation has always been my way of living and of life. And it's afforded me, you know, uh, just a comfortable way of living. And um, also it was my, you know, livelihood. So, uh, over the years, I've done several pageants, um, former Miss Continental Plus, Miss Gay US of A at large. And uh, about 2006, I, uh, after working in the community for so long and doing so many benefit shows, I wanted to be more active in my community. So um, I got hired at Miracle of Love and that started my whole journey as far as uh, trans advocacy and HIV awareness and uh, prevention. And um, about 2000 and, yeah, I would say about 2005, I started working at Pulse Nightclub and I was the, one of the lead entertainers there. And uh, of course I was there that evening, uh, the massacre and over the last three years has been a time of me getting my mental state back together and 
my livelihood back together. But also um, after last year, I was able to finally, you know, give enough love to myself. And now I have some to give back to my community. So I'm a part of the Cotigo Fund. I'm on the board there. And I'm also um, in direct contact with Mulan and Divas in Dialogue and other uh, organizations trying to get things together for our trans community. Uh, also, we have something that we're starting up a grassroots organization with myself, Mulan, and Nicole, and Ashley, and many, many others. We're doing uh, the GAP program, which is a gender advancement project. And I'm just happy to be a part of this conversation and trying to move the trans um, transgender community a little long further and uh, making us a little more visible and giving people the knowledge that they need to have and awareness about us. Thank you. I, lo I love the journey part. I think it's good for people to hear the journey because you can read about it, but when you put a face and a voice to it and hear the story from the person, it makes such a bigger, so much more of a bigger impact. Um, I want you to, if you don't mind, Nicole, I know this is gonna be 101, but I think that some people still get confused with trans, drag. I'm just saying some of the things that I've heard people say and education, education, education. And even if it's simple to us, it might not be simple to some of the people who are watching or who will watch. So can you give us just a quick 101? Yeah, absolutely. And I do, I think May that, I might be, yeah. Uh, oh, um, I think people uh, have to realize that uh, drag was the vehicle to my transition, I've always been a performer, but once I saw drag, I realized that I didn't have to be just a supporting male figure. I could finally be the leading lady in the role. So it was a refreshment for me, like getting to finally be myself in my full capacity. I'm sorry, but go ahead, Nicole. <laughs> no, 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 I was gonna say definitely, um, I, my fellow panelists could speak on this as well, but I think like 101, so if we're talking about gender, so someone who is transgender feels um, that the body that they were born in is not who they are, and some go through a transition, not all do, but will transition from either male to female, female to male, or someone who is non-binary. If someone who is non-binary, that means that they don't identify as male or female, it's more fluid. So they kind of swing back and forth, however they may feel. So if you look at that, and that's just kind of gender 101, um, then you have drag. Drag is an expression. A drag has nothing to do with anyone's gender per se. And I, I know in your mind, you're thinking, yes, it does, because it's someone um, dressing up as something, but that's just an expression. So just because a male dresses up as a woman and does drag doesn't necessarily mean that they're trans or that they want to be trans. That just means that they're expressing that character in that moment. However, there are trans women who live as women, but also perform. So I want to pass it on to either Mulan or Angelica to kind of talk a little bit more in depth of that piece. But I know when you hear it, you think it's the same, but one's really an expression and one's simply just gender. Exactly. Which is so important. And I think so that's important to differentiate. Um, oh, go ahead, Angelica. I just want to say really quick, it's so important for people to differentiate because they get this definition in their mind. They think it's one for all and all for one, and it's yes. not. Absolutely. Uh, and so they, they think dressing up is identity, whereas I love how you just said it, Nicole. It's an expression. Um, so go ahead, Angelica. I'm sorry. Well, just kind of to piggyback off of that, it, it's not only an expression, but it is uh, an art form. So there is a difference in that. We know that drag uh, originally came out, you know, from Shakespearean Shakespearean since days like uh, from actors where the male role was played by a, I mean, the female role was played by a male. So the word drag comes from dressing as girl. And it's just an art form more I so did than, not than know an that. actual identity. <laughs> yeah. It's just an art form versus uh, an identity. With transgender individuals, we found out and uh, it has been scientifically proven that in the womb, the brain is doing one thing while the body is doing another. 
we as individuals, we all have ovaries. Um, when we start in the womb, those ovaries either either drop and become testicles or they either go up and become ovaries. But it's all the way in the circle of the life cycle, you know. But uh, what happens with transgender individuals is that while the body is doing one thing, the chemicals in the mind is doing another. So it's feeling as though it's transforming to one thing when it really didn't. Absolutely. Fascinating. I, I, I'm glad that you would, took the time to, to explain because I really do. Sometimes I'm educating people that I thought would know and it sounds so much better coming from you. You explained it so well. All right, we have a question, which is a good segue already. Um, kind of one of the questions I was gonna ask. If I can ask questions, how do, you, how do you think drag culture can influence how society views transgender people? Um, Mulan personally, or Angelica. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I'll let you answer it, Angelica. Okay. Uh, I think one of the problems that we have right now, uh, drag and trans have been intertwined from the get go. I just think that now that drag has become on a more national and worldwide platform due to RuPaul's Drag Race, they get to see the whole feel of dressing as girl, but they don't allow the full experience of drag because there are a lot of transgender individuals who have been mega superstars in the drag world, but because they haven't had the platform of RuPaul's Drag Race, they're unknown. And I think that's what straight society is missing right now is the full inclusion of what you will get to see at a gay bar or at a, a regular drag show. There's every aspect of it where we even have cisgendered women who actually dress up and do drag. We actually have... Um, uh, gay girls who dress up as stud and do, uh, you know, male drag. So it's just all an art form. And I think we need to get to a point to where it can be all inclusive so that it is a full representation of exactly what drag and the art form has done for our community, uh, the gay LGBTQ plus community. Absolutely. Love it. Uh, I have to, I want to go into Black Lives Matter because there's two things to go off that. First, um, how Black Lives Matter and Black Trans Lives Matter kind of commingle and uh, support each other. But really the first question has to do with law enforcement because there's been so much violence uh, against Black trans women. Um, law enforcement, obviously there's some education that needs to be done there. Can you all talk about either experiences you've had or maybe give us an idea of what you think law enforcement can do better so that you all are uh, more cohesive and work together? Start with that one. Yeah, I think um, just really quick, I, I think it depends on where you live as well. And I don't think people realize like in Orlando and Orange County, we're very, very fortunate, but drive 40 minutes one way and all your protections are taken away. So I don't think people realize that. I think it, people think, oh, you know, wherever I can see, wherever I can read on a map, they're all protected. And it's really not that same way. And, you know, even hearing crazy stories um, in Jacksonville, it's like they had a pride and there was officers who were grabbing individuals crotch to identify their gender and just um, crazy things like that, that go on in other places, you know? And I think sometimes when it doesn't happen in our face, people assume it's not happening. Is there sensitivity training that you all uh, promote with Equality Florida? How do you work with uh, law enforcement to educate them? Because honestly, I believe uh, bad apples aside, uh, people want to be educated. They want to do the right thing. They want to treat people with respect, our law enforcement included. Um, so are there programs that Equality Florida or, you, or your different programs uh, work with law enforcement? Because we want to get to what's happening in the trans community and the murder, the murders that are going. Yeah, no, I can speak to that. I know Mulan wanted to speak on the experience really quick too. So I want to let her. Yes, please, yeah. Mulan. Oh, you're, you're still muted. muted. There you go. There you go. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I do have a lot of experience with officers. <laughs> um, that's something I'm proud of, but it's, um, and I'm speaking from the past. 
I haven't had contact with them in a while, but from my day on the streets being a sex worker and everything, the police, they were very rude. Um, they didn't respect gender. They didn't respect um, your preferred name or anything like that like that and um dealing with sex work um a lot of uh, us were we had the second guess we either wanted to call the cops for help if anything happened to us because back in that day they were if anything happened or as a rape fight or anything the first question from them would be why are you out here why are you doing this um and it always will be sir. Um, even if you ask them nicely if you think it's always sir, well, it was always sir. And I can't say they have improved with that um, to this state from the officers that I met at Bliss and everything with their program. Um, but back in the day, it was very hard to get respect from the police being trained. How about you, Angelica? Your organization. Um, well, to speak to what she's yeah, um, to speak to what she's talking about, um, recently we were able to get on a phone call with the mayor and, um, you know, try and discuss some of these things. Just a sensitivity program for law enforcement would, would do a lot. Just from, you know, the mispronouns of individuals, that can stop some of the conflict that happens, you know, that can de-escalate a situation wherein Sometimes officers, I've, I've had experience where I've been pulled over and it's been ma'am, ma'am. But when I gave my ID before I had my name changed and my gender marker changed, it was it would turn into sir. And the disrespect that would come in that would fur infuriate me. But since I was a young kid, I'm naturally black. <laughs> You know, so and from Jacksonville, so we already had these discussions at a very young age before I was even able to drive of how to conduct yourself when being pulled over by the police. You know, so there's been a lot of times where I had to bite my tongue and try to stand up for what was right, but also try and, you know, keep that boundary to where and it didn't escalate to something else. And thank God, because I'm able to still be here and live and tell the story. It's just sad that we have to do so much extra just to stay alive when we come in contact with the police. And so let's talk about the staying alive part. Um, it's, it's, it isn't carried enough by mainstream media, in my opinion. But there's almost like a near epidemic of um, murders in the black trans community. Can you all speak to what's going on? Kind of give us, I'm not sure who would have that if it's Nicole from Equality Florida or not, but can you give us an idea of what's really happening out there? And then let's take a deep dive and talk about why we think uh, the violence has increased. Yeah, I mean, I think the most frustrating piece about this is trans murders have happened for years, 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 decades. And we've been screaming from the rooftops, like, can you see us? Like, hello, we're human. They're they're killing our sisters and our brothers. And it nobody cared. You know what I mean? And now I think with the Black Lives Matter movement coming on and um, you know, it's going strong and people, it, it's really getting notoriety and people are listening and understanding and wanting to look inside at their own um their own stuff, their organization stuff. But what I think happens sometimes is even if in this big movement, black trans lives are over here. And you still see uh, videos all over online of um, black trans individuals getting beat up, jumped, killed, and it doesn't matter, you know what I mean? And I just, I get extremely, extremely frustrated when I talk about that because for years, that's why Transgender Day of Remembrance was created because nobody was recognizing the murders of our trans family throughout the year. So us as a community had to come together to do it. And for the trans community, I think it, you know, when you look at Stonewall, first ones up there started the riot. Trans people are always the ones to entertain you at the clubs, um, fight for your rights, whether it's yours, um, your brothers, your sisters, anybody. But then when it comes to our rights and our protection, people just disappear. And that happens over and over and over throughout the years. And it really just, it, I mean, being honest and vulnerable, it's defeating, you know, it's like how, does my community not support me just because of my gender identity? You know, it just, it just baffles me sometimes. It, it's baffling, honestly. And Angelica, I know you're going to speak on this too, but it's baffling to me because I just don't understand why there's such a disconnect. 
yeah. there and why why black is is it specifically black are we just hearing more reports of it or is it is do you know why we're being why they're being targeted angelica what are your thoughts on that um well like nicole is saying like for years i've heard horrible stories of all trans women being attacked you know but here recently there has been more black trans women that have been uh, murdered senselessly for apparently really no reason. Um, I think the thing behind it most of all is toxic masculinity. And it is to be to blame because of the way our patriarch is set up far as in the black community. Um, we have we as black people have already been marginalized so much we have went through so many struggles and i think there's this whole movement now about uh taking the black man and uh diminishing him and over feminizing him but re not realizing that with trans individuals this is just the way they're born you know this isn't an, an agenda to you know hurt the black male and the black family. This is just who we are. And I think if we could get people just to understand that everybody is an individual, have more compassion and understanding for people, then we won't have as many senseless murders about it. I know for a fact that most girls tell exactly what and who they are to another individual up front. And I think that's some, one of the miscommunications that people tend to have. They hear about this and they're like, oh, well, she should have told that she wasn't, you know, really a girl or maybe she she was doing, so, what did she do? They put it on the girl all the time and it's oh. really not her fault. It's the way that society has been set up and we, we, than if they to us or make people uh, feel as though, well, this guy is gay if he talks to a transgender woman. But in reality, I appear as a woman. I look as a woman. So if a man is attracted to a woman, there's no problem with him being attracted to me. That shouldn't right. make him inferior or feel as though his pride has been ripped away from him. It just is what it is. Now, it's up to you to say you want to try it or you don't. You know, but don't be upset with me because you decided to do something or act on something that you probably always wanted to do. But now the rhetoric that comes from your friends or your family or your peers is the reason why a lot of us are dead right now, because they're trying to prove their manhood. When we need men just to be men and be OK and stop trying to utilize these things that define a man. Have you, Mulan, have you experienced um, what Angelica is talking about as far as when you have shared that you're a trans woman um, with someone and they've reacted in a negative way? Have you had to deal with that? Um, yes, but um, I'm very open and honest about my thing. But I think um, I want to talk about what she was saying, how people just we lost her <laughs> i do want to expand on something that Please. angelica said so i i think this is the trans issue and this is like the black lives matter issue as well so i think what is happening now is um it's people are just taking videos now. So now that it's visible, all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we have to do something about this. Not that we've screamed and done marches and boycotted and done all of these things throughout history to show the intolerance and show the racism. Now that it's on Facebook and when you're on your couch and you see this video, now everybody's like, oh my God. And I think it's the same thing. It's a very out of sight, out of mind kind of concept. So if you're not seeing it and if it's not all over the news, then it's not happening, you know? And I just think us as a society, we have to kind of own that we do that and really realize that there's things going on in the world and we really need to work together to, to make a more united and equal community. Like we're all human and we all just want to live at the end of the day. Um, and I think all this negativity that is already on us, whether it's COVID or this or that, the last thing we need is just to keep berating and discriminating against each other. I agree. I, I think um, somebody had said 
in the black, I had uh, did a show on Black Lives Matter and uh, they had quoted someone else who said, it's not that it hasn't been happening. Like you said, it's that we now all have camera phones and we yeah. can record things and mm -hmm. you can't hide behind that any you have video proof of something happening i mean we all would be silly and ignorant if we didn't think what happened to george floyd hasn't happened so many times we can't remember we, we would have no idea how to count that high and it has been happening but now it is in the forefront because everybody can see it and there's a transparency whether they want it to be transparent or not out there uh, where people are like, I don't like that. We want to hold you accountable for that. Wow, this is really happening in my backyard. This is happening to people that I go to church with, I work with, I work out with, mm -hmm. um, I'm friends with, I'm neighbors with, because you just didn't want to believe it. Because honestly, you thought when you heard the story, oh, that only happens once in a blue moon. Or like, I forget if it was Nicole or Angelica said, well, you know, she probably didn't say something, so she deserved it. Uh, that kind of mentality is so wrong. Yeah. And I think that I love the fact that there's been at least an increased accountability and awareness because of the camera phones and people really standing up and saying things. And social media has really been a powerful proponent of um, all of the social change, I think. Tell me about jobs right. just a little bit. And go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, there I'm sorry, but there's something to be said about when something is visible. I mean, when we look at what happened on Bloody Sunday uh, with the Selma March, the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1960, uh, I can't remember the year, but 1964. That probably if white people who were at home didn't realize and see what was happening to black people on a regular basis. You know, so it, it's something to be said about when you're able to take something from your community from. And now it's some of that affects change. So that's why we need all these issues to be visible and upfront so that other people can hear and see it. And then maybe they'll form some type of compassion and understanding about it. To want to change. The, that's the goal, right? The awareness brings more knowledge and education, which leads to hopefully a bigger heart and more compassion for what other people are going through. Even if it is so far removed from what your life is like, it's their lives and we need to be cognizant and respectful and loving and supportive. I wanna ask you about jobs, really. We had a couple of questions and I heard, I forget, somebody mentioned that, it might've been you, Nicole. Um, why would an employer be afraid to hire a trans applicant? What is, what is the pushback that you hear? Because I, I have, I've had um, a few trans women on the show before, and that always seemed to be one of the biggest hurdles is getting fully accepted. You, you got your family, those that love you, those that support you, you got your friends, and then you wanna have a career in what you love to do. And because you're trans, you're held down. Why? You know, I think um, like first and foremost, no, ed like education, individuals aren't educated on what a trans individual is, how they live, you know, whatever the case may be. I also think uh, religion, people like to pull the religion card all the time and say, you know, because of my religion, I can accept you and this, this and that. Um, and I also think there's just this stigma around being trans. You know what I mean? Angelica spoke about it. It's like a guy will look at you, be attracted to you, want to date you in private, but God forbid their friends find out or their family finds out. And it's this whole thing. It's this culture of society making men feel like they are less than for liking us. And I think that trickles down into work as well. If you have, it depends on the, the field and it depends on the job. But if you're a front facing job, like a receptionist or anything like that, and they don't feel you look the part, not that anybody needs to look any specific way, but you know, certain jobs have certain requirements. I think that comes into it. Or if, I mean, I've heard weird things like, oh, if we have too many trans people working, you know, people may think this is just an LGBTQ place. And I'm like, is that a problem? Is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with people? <laughs> yeah, like people are just, I think there's a lot of reasons that go into it. And it's very um, kind of just circumstantial, whichever, happens with that specific moment but 
all of it just doesn't make sense. Because to me, if you are a true business person, you want to be inclusive because you want to have as many happy employees as you can to keep your business going. And that means that if your employees feel comfortable and safe with you, they're going to do 150% for you. You know, and I don't think it should matter on your gender identity. Agreed. Angelica? Um, there's a lot to say about just discrimination in the workplace, period, when it comes to transgender individuals. Um, when I was first coming out about 96, it wasn't even an option, really, to have a a regular nine to five job. I mean, for most people who decide to go ahead and live in their truth and, and live in their trans realness, uh, you have to make a decision where there was really only two or three things that you could do. You either were a sex worker or you ended up working at a gay bar or you end up doing drag at a gay bar. And that was your way of living. I think a lot of things have changed now, but I think the reason why employers are afraid of hiring transgender individuals is, um, for one, uh, there's something to be said about being passable. <laughs> um, that can help, but at the same time, everyone isn't um, quote unquote passable. But I think there's that issue of what will the customers say, or uh, it might make our customers feel this kind of way or and we don't want to put that out there. So there's a lot of different things that go into that. But with the discrimination laws that we have and that have been passed now, I think that it will get better. Um, and I think that, you know, trans people have a better way of life and living and able to just even, you know, have those dreams now, you know, because for me, my dream, it worked out for me because I've always wanted to be an entertainer or a performer. So I was able to go into that field, but to try and do it on a straight platform, that was what happened for me. So I thank God for my gay community, you know, and being able to have those outlets where I could do what I wanted to do and do what I loved, you know, but it wasn't like that for everyone, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's still a challenge. I, 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 I do feel like there's got... There I feel like we're moving forward, even if it's the most babyest step on the planet. Equality Florida helps with that. Awareness, you're doing awareness, all of the hard work that all of you do to bring awareness and to educate, 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 educate a thousand times over. Um, and most of us need to have our heads uh, examined on the education side because we sometimes don't get it. And so that's why you have to have many shows, many discussions. And I appreciate you all being open and sharing and educating us. So I, I have other questions that people ask prior, mainly about how do they get involved? What is, the, what is a way that an ally or advocate like me um, or anyone who's in the community that says, I, I want to try to help make a difference, what's the best way for them to get involved? Yeah, I would say hold your friends and your coworkers and your family accountable. We've all been around. We've all heard the anti-trans conversation or a trans woman comes up on TV and somebody makes a comment. Challenge that. Say, why do you feel that way? What, you know, what, what part do you not understand? That's really when people say, how can I be an ally? Sometimes people don't have the capacity to literally volunteer or literally go somewhere. But being an ally is having our back just as much as having it in front of us, you know what I mean? So if you can get somebody in your family or your friend circle to look differently on trans and non-binary individuals, then your allyship is good. You've done your job, you know what I mean? So that's for me, just kind of a simple way that everybody can be an ally. Basic 101 stuff like that is impactful and powerful. If you take a stand yeah. and ask the questions, challenge, whatever they are saying, if you know that it is not the right way to be. Uh, how about you, Angelica? Um, uh, I think what she's saying is pretty much true. Uh, education, educate yourself, you know, and um, people perish from lack of knowledge. So the more that you educate yourself, the more that you get to know, and, and it kind of just goes back to what I've been saying. Everybody is blessed to be an individual. Twins don't even have the same fingerprint. And I've been preaching this for the last uh, some years. It's just 
to allow people to be just that, their individual selves. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of things that unite us, but there are a lot of things that separate us. And I think that was a great grand design that God did when in making us the human race is that no one person is alike. And you only have this shell and this body to live in. So if you respect it and respect others and others' decisions, then we'll be in a better place socially, period, you know? And um, I think that would go a long, long way. Uh, And guys listening out there, girls listening out there, uh, people listening out there, it is such a simple thing what they just said. (laughs) It's a simple thing to do. Educate yourself. Uh, be compassionate, be kind, be understanding, and be accepting because you're your own individual. And just like Angelica just said, everybody's got their own unique fingerprint. And so you're your own unique person. And I just want people to be more accepting and um, all of the hard work that you all are doing. I know it's making strides. I'm a, I'm a hopeful, optimistic person. And so I believe you're making a big impact on the world. And thank you for sharing your stories. And thank you for what you do. Really appreciate it. All right, Nicole Parker, Angelica Jones. We had Mulan Williams on earlier. Equality Florida is one of the organizations, eqfl.org. And then you can reach out to me. I can put you in touch with Gina or Nicole, Angelica, Mulan, and Angela, who did pop on and say hi for a second uh, earlier. Uh, You guys are amazing. I would love if you ever have something you want to promote or talk about, you are always welcome back on the show. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Have a good night. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. You too. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Well, maybe we'll go by.